Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the second lecture in this series. And uh, first of all, I'm very glad that some of you took up the challenge of doing exercises. That's great. And that's the only way to learn. Uh, so let me recap uh, what we did last time. We uh, considered Euclidean version of the action of a particle on a circle with a full derivative term which classically is unobservable as it is full derivative and doesn't affect equations of motion. And uh, after weak rotation, after going to imaginary time, uh, we have this term with uh, uh, imaginary unit in front of it. So it's imaginary. It's a topological term because it doesn't depend on reparameterization of the, of the time. The quantum version of the theory is uh, to consider partition function uh, with the weight given by this action. And as you can see, the weight corresponding to topological term is phase. So as a result, this term uh, leads to the interference between different topological sectors. So they can not only with positive uh, weights as in statistical mechanics, but they can actually uh, uh, dis destroy each other, relate each other. Okay. Another talk about quantum theory is not to go to Euclidean time, but just talk about Hamiltonian Relation. This is the Hamiltonian. The A, which is the flux through the ring uh, of a magnetic field, is uh, entering Hamiltonian explicitly and affects the spectrum, as we saw in the pictures. In particular, for A equals one half, we have degeneracy of the ground state. Uh, uh, some note, then you might try to remove this A. And it's indeed, if you say that, let me replace psi by e to the i A uh, phi psi prime, where psi is a wave function which is phi dependent, then of course Hamiltonian is transformed according to this and becomes 1 over 2m minus i d phi squared. Okay, so we completely removed a from the Hamiltonian. However, you have to remember now that if psi is a periodic function with respect to, to phi, then, then uh, because of this factor, uh, pi prime is not anymore. So what we did is we actually exchanged uh, the dependence on A to the dependence on, on boundary conditions. And this is indeed the alternative way of treating this flux through the ring. You can say that flux through the ring then, uh, and, and periodic boundary conditions on the particle on the ring. Or you can say that no flux, but I can see the twisted boundary conditions through the ring. So this is one of the options. But you do not remove. The spectrum or all physical observables still know that there is a flux there. If A is not zero or not integer number. However, integer valued A's are not observable because you can remove them by this information. But now, if A is integer, this does not violate periodic boundary conditions. OK? Any questions? OK. So. Before go, still going to the uh, topic of, uh, of this lecture, let me spend probably 10 minutes or so with a few words on, on quantum anomalies. So what I did in these lectures is I've chosen some unifying uh, perspective on these topological phases, uh, talking about topological terms, the terms in the effective action which do not depend on metric. But there are other points of use. For example, one another very powerful and unifying way of talking about these things is using the concept of quantum anomalies. So a few words on quantum anomalies. I guess Giuseppe Mussardo tomorrow is going to talk about conformal anomalies. This is one of the examples of quantum anomalies. So uh, symmetries are very important in physics. But not only symmetries, but also breaking of symmetries. And symmetries can be broken in several ways. The first one is explicit. Suppose that you have something symmetric, and then you add some, some term or interaction which violates the symmetry. That's broken. <coughs> so no symmetry. Actually, it's just no symmetry. But it makes sense to talk about explicit symmetry breaking because that term can be particularly small. So you can still use approximate symmetry. So it's not totally uh, uh, fair to say that explicit symmetry breaking is like no symmetry at all. You can play with, with the smallness of symmetry breaking terms. That's one way. Another way, as you know very well, is spontaneous symmetry breaking. 
of SSB. And this is uh, when you have Hamiltonian of your system, which is symmetric with respect to some uh, set of transformations, but the ground state is not. Okay? So ground state violates the symmetry. It does not mean that symmetry is, you have to forget about symmetry because there are consequences of Hamiltonian being symmetric. For example, you can have degenerate ground states corresponding to non-trivial actions of symmetry operations on the ground state and so Goldstone modes and so on and so forth. But there is one more way, which is often omitted in elementary uh, textbooks, is a quantum anomaly. And this is a very important way of symmetry breaking. Uh, and this is our quantum anomaly is uh, the case when your classical theory has some symmetry, but quantum, symmetry, uh, quantum theory cannot have this symmetry. So you try to quantize, and as a result of quantization, you break this symmetry. More technically, if you quantize as a path integral, and you say that your action has some symmetry, it does not necessarily mean that your measure has this symmetry. And therefore, the full quantum theory, which is given by partition function, does not have this symmetry. That's what usually happens. And this is, our, again, technically comes usually this way, that you have some classical theory, like field theory usually, and then you try to regularize this theory at small distances. When you regularize, you break this symmetry, and then you try to remove regularization, but symmetry is still broken. And that's what quantum anomaly is. Okay? So basically, symmetries of classical theories do not survive quantization. That's what quantum anomaly is. Uh, very often, it is the result of conflicting symmetries. Very often, you have several symmetries in, in classical theory. And then you have a choice. When you regularize, you say, that symmetry is sacred for me. I will keep it. But then you lose the other one. And if you do it vice versa, you lose the first one. So they're kind of not compatible with each other. So Carroll anomaly is an example of this when you have Carroll uh, axial symmetry and vector uh, symmetry. Yes? I, uh, I can give you an example, which is illustrates, but, but, it, but essentially what it is is that when you integrate over passes, you have to define how you integrate, what, with what, what is the measure on the space of passes. And you have to define this measure, and this measure cannot have symmetry that you, you want to have of the classical action. That's the result. So again, it usually comes in quantum field series because there you have uh, you have, uh, like, for example, for fermions, typically you have the uh, infinitely many states as the negative energies, and you have to do something about it. For example, you introduce lattice regularization, and lattice breaks symmetry, and then you cannot uh, have the symmetry anymore. But let me give you some simple example, which is very intuitive, and, and you see what it means. Now, and this is an example when you have uh, a supremacy of solid-state physics, because from solid-state physics point of view, you understand it pretty clearly, but from field theory point it's very subtle phenomena. So, so let me explain. Suppose that you have a band structure like this. So, this is your opinion, right? <laughs> this is my objective opinion, correct. <laughs> okay, anyway, this is the one point of view, okay? So suppose that I have, I, I have a dispersion like this. Okay, minus, I draw minus one. So uh, this is a typical uh, dispersion in solid state physics. And I can see the one dimensional example of one dimensional crystal hopping model and something like that. And suppose that I have chemical potential somewhere here, which means that states here are all filled, right? So there are particles here sitting in those states, and there are ho holes, so no particles here. This is the ground state of my problem, OK? I am interested in low energy physics, means the low energy excitations. Low energy excitations can be obtained if you perturb particles around Fermi surface. You cannot take particle from here, because if you take it from here, you can put it there only, and that will be high energy. I want to consider very low temperatures, much smaller than the bandwidth. Remember that in solid state physics, this is of the order of electron volt, which is 10,000 Kelvin. 
and I'm interested in like room temperature, which is really small, or even low temperature. Okay. So what I'm looking for is the vicinity of these points only. And I mean, I can just put this picture together, and then I see picture which is in like in this limit indistinguishable from one-dimensional Dirac Fermat. Okay. So in this example, I will not write any formulas. I'll just explain what's going on. So you call these fermions here, this branch, you call right fermions because they move to the right. They have positive velocity. And these fermions, you can left fermions. So this branch, you call left, and this is right. OK? And classically, you look at this one and, and, and you usually perturb it by taking fermion from here, putting there, creating particle hole pair, and the number of right fermions and left fermions can serve separately. And indeed, if you write this low energy theory, you will see that, that it is possible to, to write operator which, which are the, the current for right and left fermions is, is conserved separately, uh, classically. However, let me apply electric field this way. Then, from solid state physics point of view, what happens is very easy to understand. What happens is that the all fermions will be moving to the right more. So they will be, in, in a short time, this will be the filling. So the fermions, okay, so my solid dots here are field states and the, and the empty, so circles are uh, holes. So they moved like this. But now take me, let me take a look at the vicinity of the surface here. What I see is that right fermions are created and left fermions disappeared. So the total number of fermions, total number of electrons is preserved. But the right ones appeared out of nothing and the left ones are, uh, uh, disappeared. Okay. So if you look only at one branch of the right fermions, this is your chemical potential, you see like they, when, when you apply electric fields, they continue uh, the, being created out of vacuum. Because vacuum has a lot of fermions. It's like infinitely many field states from this point of view. But what actually happens is that actually they're coming from the left, but through this bottom of the, of the band. So from solid state physics, this is just fermions moving to the right, all of them. But from the point of view of this uh, Dirac theory, you see that although naively, classically, uh, they conserve separately, but together there will be an equation which violates conservation of the right and left uh, current separate. This is more an example of how projecting on the low-energy theory can uh, you can use the first. Not, not, because the first because the projection is because the projection Suppose I give you classical Dirac theory. I, t I tell you that let's describe the, the, the theory with this classical linear spectrum. And you classically can write a lot of equations. You will notice theory. And then I try to write classical version. Suppose you don't know about this lattice at all. You just have this linear spectrum as, as experimental fact, which is you do for electron, right? For real electron, uh, relativistic Dirac spectrum. Or, uh, okay. So you try to quantize the theory. You're trying to define what the measure is in pass integral. One way of quantizing this would be to simulate it by the one-dimensional lattice and say that what we have actually is that this theory is, appears only as effective theory of some well-defined uh, well uh, state, which is defined at all scales using lattice. This is one of the ways of quantizing theory. So what I'm saying is that from the perspective that I start from the lattice and I describe this, no anomaly. It's, it's, it's all very obvious and exists, and, and uh, phenomenon still exists. You still have number of fermions and the right Fermi surface are increasing with time when you have electric field. But it's not mystery phenomenon. But if you look at, if your starting point is this, and you're trying to quantize it, and now notice that I did it using the lattice. You can do it differently. You can do ultraviolet cutoff. You can do dimensional regularizations of various types. Nevertheless, you will come out uh, with the same equations that the number of right and left fermions cannot be conserved separately. OK? So it's basically, from this point of view, anomaly is just, it's actually, we can say that there is no anomaly if the theory is well defined at all scales, including ultraviolets, then there are no anomalies. It's, it's all the same. 
But when you're lim interested in the limit of infinitely many degrees of freedom, this, this makes sense. Yes? Is there a reason that the anomaly is essential and not free coming from an unstable level? Like, the momentum is not used, large and large. Right. Okay. The, what I explained. It does not mean that this is all trivial stuff, because describing this from this point of view is much simpler than putting it on a lattice and then removing lattice regularizations and so on and so forth. And the real question now is translated into the fact why are for different regularizations I have the same results, or slightly different results, but different in a very particular way. So, so basically, you have some theory which is has classical symmetries. You want to quantize it. You have a problem. You regularize it. You break symmetries. And then you notice that as a result, some symmetry laws are broken, but they're not broken in an arbitrary way. They're broken in a very particular way. It has very good algebraic structure studied and, and all that. So it's, it's really, there is some meaning in it. And uh, as you, you will see probably tomorrow, uh, what happens with conformal symmetry is that you have this conformal symmetry classically. Any conformal transformations give you symmetry. But then when you quantize symmetry, only a small conformal group survives, but all the rest are broken, but in a very particular way, so that Virasor algebra has a very particular extra term, not broken in an arbitrary way. So quantum anomalous symmetry breaking is not just that you just break symmetry. You still have some effects which remember that it's actually symmetry of classical theory. But anyway, so unfortunately, I will not be able to talk too much about anomalies, although this is a very interesting uh, thing. But let me give you one example of how this anomaly comes out in the particle in the ring. And I will give you as, a, as an exercise. First of all, if you want to see this exercise solves, well, it's, I, I will almost solve it. Then look at this paper. Appendix D. The paper is about QCD and using anomaly structures to fix some phase diagram of QCD. And this is a paper of Gayota, Kapustin, Margotsky, and Zyberg. So I'll take a look. But in Appendix D, they specifically describe uh, truth anomaly for particle in a ring, particle in a circle. And let me just do it as an exercise for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a set of sim very simple statements, and you just have to check all of them, right? So we start with Hamiltonian. Which is our Hamiltonian of a particle in a ring. We expect O2 symmetry from this Hamiltonian, right? O2 symmetry means that we have two types of generators. One generator is rotation by the angle alpha, and this is like additive, like O alpha times O beta is a billion O alpha plus beta, right? If you rotate by angle alpha and then by angle beta, it's the same as rotating by angle alpha plus beta. But you also have OC, which is uh, essentially uh, replaces angle phi to minus phi, it's reflection. And there is a particular algebra between O alpha and, and OC which you can figure out, okay? So now, what are the symmetries that I want to see here? I want to see gauge invariance. Gauge invariance means that I'm, I want to be able to shift A to, to A plus or minus one, correct? So the exercise is that if you take operator, which is given explicitly by E to the I phi, then u dagger h a, u h two gives you h a minus one, which means that the spectrum for operator h a is the same as the spectrum of operator h a minus one, and all observables are related by this unitary transformation. Okay, that's that's one of the exercises to check. But that's kind of obvious almost. So rotations, rotations mean phi goes to phi plus alpha. This is O alpha symmetry group. So let's introduce O alpha equals E to the alpha d phi. If you apply this operator to any function of phi, phi will be shifted by alpha. Okay? And show that O alpha dagger, which is also obvious, O alpha commutes with H. So O alpha is symmetry. 
Now we want to do reflection, which is phi goes to minus phi. And you can see that if you take operator which inverts the, the sine of phi here, then you will see that HA goes to H minus A. So this is not symmetry, right? Not symmetry for arbitrary A, for arbitrary A. Uh, so let us consider two special cases. Suppose A is 0, then OC or alpha are symmetries. And if you check, then you see that OC or alpha, OC is nothing else but O minus alpha. And this is, of course, representation of O2. which consists of rotations and reflections, right? Right, so if you reflect, rotate by alpha, and then reflect back, it's the same as rotating by minus alpha. And that, that's truly representation. So for A equals zero, no problems, you realized your O2 symmetry. Let's consider another possibility, A equals one half, which is half of the flux quantum. Why is it, is it the candidate? Because if you reflect, then you see that generally A goes to minus A, but one half going to minus one half means that A changed by, changed by one. But by one you can change using the gauge invariant. So flux plus one half quantum is equivalent to plus, flux minus one half quantum because the difference is one quantum which is not observable. Okay? Make sense? That's, yeah, you can say so, right? Yeah, it's, it's a bit, you, you need a little bit more effort to show that, but indeed, yes, that's related. Okay, so OC is not symmetry, strictly speaking, uh, but let's introduce OC tilde, which is OC times U dagger, where U is introduced there is multiplication by E to say I phi. And this is symmetry. So what you have is your OC or alpha, OC tilde. You can do this computation. This is all exercise to, to check this computation. Is O minus alpha. So it looks almost what you need. And moreover, it's different by phase only. And phase in quantum mechanics is sort of doesn't change the state. Oh, it's minus alpha, yeah. Oh, thank you. But this is not a representation of O2. This is projective representation. So one way of saying that quantum anomaly here is manifested in the fact that you cannot find true representation of O2, but you can uh, deal only with projective representations. However, there is alternative, which is trying to fix this problem as well. So alternative, let's introduce, instead of rotations, let's introduce modified rotations. So let's just do multiplication by phase every time we do rotation by alpha, okay? Then you can easily check That, I mean, you can definitely see from here that e to the alpha can be split into alpha over two and alpha over two, and it's absorbed into O's and gives you this, right? So this looks like O2, right? But not really, because if you look at the operator or two pi tilde, which is rotation by angle two pi, which doesn't do anything, and multiplication by e to the i pi, which is minus one. Not one. 
So what you do here is you sort of replaced O2 group by its double covering. So rotation by 2 pi now is not a trivial element, but the element which multiplies everything by minus 1. So technically, you replace O2 to its double cover, which is called pin 2 group. So as a result, you have not O2 symmetry, but actual double cover of O2. So original symmetry, which is naively you think is true, that is, is not there. Yes? So I Take a look at how O2 pi acts on state. So O2 pi tilde consists of, of two. O2 pi is, is just trivial. It's nothing. But then substitute 2 pi here, and you have minus 1. So it actually multiplies states by minus 1. Say it again. Why is it not unitary? Uh, that's, that's true, but I don't think it, it matters. Okay, let, let me see. So you can, you can fix, fix it. Or, or, yeah, so let, me, let me not spend time on that. Good, good question. I'll, I'll think on how to reply. Yes? Say, say it again. This is called pin group. Just to Google it, Google it up. And this is just, just as, as this is the, the standard notation for the group, which is double cover of O2. OK? OK, so basically, this is only comment I want to say, that already in this very simple example, you have uh, anomaly playing some role. That at A equals 1 half, you expect really all symmetries to be the same, uh, including a reflection. But it turns out that you really need to extend your group and to change it a little bit. Or, or consider uh, projective representations. OK? Uh, I, no, no. What I'm saying is that take classical problem without flux. Then you just don't, then you have reflection symmetry and rotation symmetry. You have O2 group, no matter what flux is, because it's insensitive to flux. So there you have full set of symmetries. Now I want to quantize it. OK, I want to quantize it. And I see that there is additional parameter A which appears as a result of uh, ambiguity of quantization. Well, A equals 0 we still have all the same symmetries. That's fine. A arbitrary does not have reflection whatsoever. So it's just, it just breaks this uh, quantum me in quantum mechanics explicitly. So you can already say that this is sort of anomaly. But for A equals 1 half, which is half of the flux quantum, uh, when you reflect it, this is changes to minus 1 half, which is supposed to be an unobservable change. So you might think that this is really, uh, for 1 half, there is a parity symmetry. And indeed, there is a degeneracy of ground state, and it's all state symmetric. Remember, we, we saw this parabola, which symmetric states. Uh, true. Generally, you don't even care too much, but, but uh, unless these symmetries lead to some observations. For example, if you will break gauge symmetry, which is charge conservation as a result of quantization, this is really drastic, right? We usually say that those theories are not allowed because of those anomalies. So in this case, you see that, I mean, this A, which is arbitrary, breaks parity, and OK, so what? It's, 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 it's not, not a problem. But, but nevertheless, you are trying to say, is it possible to quantize classical theory to preserve symmetries? And in some cases, the answer is yes. And in some cases, the answer is actually no. And in addition, and this is you can actually learn from that paper quite a lot. They use it really state of art use of these things to uh, figure out something about complicated theories. So uh, in a particular one way of saying this, if you really think deeply about this, then the reason you cannot really do this implies that the ground state is doubly degenerate. So you really can conclude that there is some degeneracy because you cannot uh, uh, do, do the symmetry. So, but, but think about it on your own or read that paper. OK, okay so uh, now let me conclude my, my first exploration of theta, ter theta terms. 
So to remind you, we can see that a very particular uh, term uh, in, in, and now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to write in some almost arbitrary order the properties of theta terms. Hope that you will recognize many of these properties from the properties we discussed for the particle in the circle, but I'm trying to claim that this is more general thing. So first, theta terms assign complex weights in, in partition function to, to various configurations. Uh, to space-time textures with integer topological charge Q. So basically, you write Z as sum over Q, e to the i theta Q, and then pass integral within the sector Q. That's a typical structure that you have. And, and, and here you have. Okay. So even in Euclidean formulations, these are complex weights. So realize reducible one-dimensional representations of the homotopy group uh, uh, of d-dimensional, this is dimensional space-time. And this is the manifold of your field. In our case, it was pi 1 of S1, because we have one-dimensional time and, and one-dimensional circle as a manifold. But this is general. This is usually called target space, because you can see the mappings from the space-time into that target. Okay. Then quantum interference between topological sectors. They do not affect equations of motion of the system, but they do affect spectrum. because they change the rules for how spectrum is quantized. Okay. So there is a periodicity in the coupling constant theta. In our case, theta was 2 pi a. So period 2 pi. We just usually normalize coupling constants so it has period 2 pi. Theta itself is not quantized. So it can take any values, values mod 2 pi, yes? Uh, sorry, so space time. Space time. Uh, when we, it's a good question. When we had circle, we basically thought about phi as a function of time. So phi was our target space. We didn't think about, uh, when I talk about space time, I, did, I, I think in terms of field theories, when fields are functions of x and t. Here, my field is phi, which is function of t. Yeah. So theta is not quantized. Uh, if if Q is integer, as I, I think, gave you example on, uh, before, that if, uh, if those charges belong to Z2, for example, say they can take only quantized values. But for this one, take, say they can take any values between 0 and pi. However, for theta equals 0 and pi, we usually have additional symmetry. Well, in, in our case, it was parity or reflection. Okay. Theta equals pi is especially interesting because 
it results in some degeneracies of the ground states, or in field theories, it will result in the, in the gapless excitations. Uh, the most known example probably is spin one half chain, which, according to general arguments for nonlinear sigma model, is supposed to have a gap. But because of that particular, say, the term with coefficient pi, it actually has gapless excitations, which are called spin-ons. We will talk about this next lecture. Okay. Equivalent to the change of boundary conditions. So these theta terms can be usually removed by changing the boundary conditions in the path integral. And finally, this theta is new parameter, absent in classical theory, but appearing as a result of quantization. And it appears as ambiguity of quantization of the classical problem when configuration space is multiply connected. So when you have different passes for fields. Okay? So this is a summary of general properties of theta terms. I, of course, illustrated this on the particle in a circle, but uh, if you have the same type of topological terms, then, uh, then you have these properties. Uh, the theta term is an example of topological term but it's not the only type of topological terms. There are topologi other topological terms which also do not depend on metric, and therefore they are referred as topological, but which are not of this type and have different properties. Yes? In terms of quantum interference between two sectors, yes. why is it quantum? What makes it quantum? Uh, the, the presence of that uh, e to the i theta q is necessarily quantum. It appears only after we do pass integral. Before we do pass integral, we, before we do classical, we write phi dot in the action and we can remove it completely. Also, think about what is written there in the partition function. So suppose that I have uh, some, uh, some field configuration and I evolve it in time. Okay? And in this evolution, or I evolve it back to itself, for example, and this is Q equals 1. So some particular configuration of fields which has non-trivial topological charge. And then I do it differently. I take it also and evolve it going around some hole, or not, or here I go around some hole, here I don't, and Q equals zero in this case. And then I arrive back. So in quantum mechanics, my amplitude of, of return should be this pass plus this pass. But now they have relative sign, relative phase between them. So they just do not add up but they can actually cancel each other, they interfere. Okay, so the quantum means that I should superimpose all the possible paths. Of course. Okay, and then because the result of some of these paths have different views, okay, that's why it's easier. Okay, right, right, yes. Wait for, ten, wait, wait for 10 minutes, okay? Because the topic of today's lecture is totally different type of topological term, which is called Vesumina term, and it cannot be represented this way, and it has different properties. Now, you know what's the hardest thing in preparing these lectures? Is, is to select what to skip. That's really tough. Okay, so now more questions about that? Now we change gears and go to a very different example. Uh, but before that, we go about one single quantum spin. So the topic will be pass integral. For a single. quantum spin. Okay? And let's start with discussion of quantum spin. So I, we have SU2 algebra, 
with generators S A, A equals 1, 2, 3, or X, Y, Z. And we have commutator, which is given by, by, by this expression, times I. Okay. This is standard uh, commutation of spins. Uh, so this is generally uh, representation. Uh, this is generally SU2 algebra. If I want to fix representation, then what we usually do is we write S squared and fix it to be some number S times S plus 1. The S squared is a Casimir of this algebra. The S squared commutes with this algebra. Actually, to consider even S squared, you have to go outside of definition of Lie algebra, but but basically, if you just take and, and commute it with S S B, you'll see that it commutes. So you can consider the space on which this S squared is, has a fixed value. And uh, as we can see later, this S necessarily is half integer or integer. Okay? So this is the algebra itself. This is the representation of the algebra. So let me consider Hamiltonian. For simplicity, Hamiltonian will not play important role. Remember, for topological terms, Hamiltonian is zero. But, but let me consider still for definiteness Hamiltonian, which is given like this, just to show you what this spin is about. So what this Hamiltonian is trying to do is it's trying to align spin S uh, uh, along the magnetic field H. So the H here is some fixed magnetic field. OK? So then, according to rules, of Heisenberg equation of motion, then you have to compute commutator of the Hamiltonian with spin. And this gives you S times H. OK, if you did not do this exercise, please do. Remember that this is vector product which in components can be written as epsilon A, B, C, S, B, H, C. Okay? So you can just do this exercise. So if you think of S as classical vector, what it does is that you have a magnetic field, you have vector, and this vector rotates around magnetic field, which is spin precession. But this generally here, so far, S is operator. Okay? It's very well known that the classical limit when s goes to infinity, the s here is zs. Okay? I don't know how to make notations different, but no vector there. If s goes to infinity, this is classical limit. Why is this is classical limit? Because you can introduce first operator, which is equal to operator s divided by the value s. And then you try to see what the commutation relations for n's are. And you will see that this is, will be n divided by s. So the, this big s will be in denominator here. Uh, and as a result, uh, when s goes to infinity, commutator goes to 0, now, the same as h bar going to, z to 0, and you go to classical, classical limit. Okay? Uh, suppose that I'm doing this at the level of operators. Let's commute n a and n b. Okay. Then let me do it. Epsilon A, B, C, and C divided by S. Right? So when S goes to infinity, these guys become commuting. And this is the same like as H bar. Usually on the right hand side you write I H bar. So the same as going to H bar going to zero. So this is classical limit. In fact, if I restore H bar, there will be H bar here. But okay. But I put h bar equals 1, so instead of h bar, I put take s to infinity. OK? I mean, you should have done this exercise. This is why, for macroscopic bodies, we think of angular momentum as a classical object. But for quantum problems, this is actually quantized and, and should be treated as quantum operator. OK, so what I'm saying is that this n, in the limit of s going to infinity, becomes classical unit vector. n squared equals 1, so which means that n belongs to a two-dimensional sphere, 
uh, topologically, and the equations of motion becomes Vtn equals n cross h. And now I'm allowed to think of n as a classical, as a classical vector. Does it make sense? Any questions? Yes. So if you, in a sense, if you use the kinds of information, or you use the commutators, so if you use the quantum mass, and then you went to the classical limit by uh, virtue of the classical limit. So right. Okay. Right. Uh, my goal uh, to align it to, with the previous lecture will be totally opposite. What I'm going to ask you now is, suppose that you have this equation, and you know that there is some classical unit vector which satisfies this equation. How can I quantize it? Okay, but but I just motivated it by vice versa because you know better as you two part of the story than this story. I'm pretty sure because this story is not in all textbooks yet, although it should be for probably like 100 years already. I'm not talking about quantization, but I'm talking about what I'm going to talk next. So first question is: Can you write the classical action for M such that this is an equation of motion? Andrea, you tell me when to stop for the break, right? Because, because everything is shifted. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, any questions here? Well, when I ask, I ask question, do you have any uh, candidates for the action which will produce this equation of motion? Huh? Yeah, so, but, so my suggestion to you how to quantize, just write classical action which produces this as the, as the equation of motion and then put it in pass integral and say, well, this is like really not the whole story yet, but at least this will give you first idea of quantum theory. So, but for, need, for this, I need classical action. What is it? I just want you to appreciate that this is not so trivial. Right. So, for example, uh, Hamiltonian, well, Hamiltonian is pretty, it's here, right? So it should be H times N times S, where S is just number. So Hamiltonian we know. But, but what about Lagrangian in action? OK. Yes. Uh, when you write down the Miller Lagrange equation for a particle in the magnetic field, we get something like this exactly, right? Did we? We don't want to go like the field. But in that case, we should require it should be maybe the curve or something that in this in that case, it should be no matter. From Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hear both these both comments which which were there were correct. Let me write down the answer and then we'll just check that this answer is correct. So let me write that S of n equals minus four pi s and then times one over four pi till dt. 1 minus cosine theta dt phi. By the way, this notation, I use it all the time. It means partial derivative with respect to time. Right? <laughs> and, and, but not the whole story, plus integral over dt s h times n. Okay? Here, I used particular parameterization I said I use spherical coordinates. I said that my vector n is characterized by polar angle theta and azimuthal angle phi. So this is a particular choice of coordinate, which I of course hate, and that's we will we'll try to get rid of it, but but nevertheless this is what it is. This term is easily can be recognized as minus integral over time of Hamiltonian. 
And this term is actually should be thought about pi q dot. P q dot, sorry. P q dot. So what we're dealing with is a phase space uh, version of the action. So it's not so remember we did already talk about this before. When you have phi dot squared over two, you can write action which is integral of a time of this, or you can write the action which is the functional of p and phi, and and then it's written this way. Okay? Then when you take variation over p and remove it, you will get back to this one. So you need one extra step. So this is a phase space version of the action, and this is just the action we are used to. Okay? Nevertheless, it's very easy to check that this is indeed true, uh, and, and so n can be written as uh, cosine theta, cosine phi, cosine theta, sine phi, sine theta in Cartesian components, right? Let's take variation of this action with respect to phi. Yes? This one? Yeah, the S one is the, the actual value of the spin, yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, sorry, I have too many S's, but uh, yeah, but okay. Something like that. So this is the actual value of, of spin. Okay, so how to check it? First of all, notice that this is H. Uh, suppo um, so, okay, suppose that I choose a particular coordinate system, so H is looking up. So I'm counting my angles from the H. Then this is just H times cosine theta, if you multiply by n, you see that this functional depends on phi only here. If you vary over phi, you switch derivative here, you see that theta is constant. So theta, so strictly speaking, dt of 1 minus cosine theta is 0, which means that theta is constant. Okay. So in, and, and you can vary over theta. And, and you will see how phi changes and its precession. Phi just goes with constant velocity. Yes? So why do we keep the module so aggressive to the action? I mean, it's just a, it's a multiplicative constant. This one? You will see, because I want to quantize it. When you don't quantize it, I can forget about this, and it will work. Like, like, like when in, in past integrals there is h bar, which is a common factor. Of course, you can get rid of it, but, but, but it is important. So, so I will keep it for future. But you can definitely check that that, that, that works, that these uh, uh, equations will do give you precession in this equation. So this is the action which produces the right classical equation of motion. And this object I will call W O. And this object is very important. This is the analog of this Zumina term. Which is also known as this Zumina Witten term sometimes. Which is also known as this Zumina Witten Novikov term. Which is even more rare. Uh, and, and the use is usually the following. Ves Zumina introduced this term actually for 3 plus 1 uh, system to describe Karel um, algebra. Then Witten clarified a lot on geometric and topological aspects of it and considered it in particular in 1 plus 1 in extensively. And Novikov, I think before all of this, or I, I don't remember actually the days, considered this as multi-valued functionals in mathematics. Novikov is topologist, so, so it, it was not related to physics at that point. Okay? So what is this uh, WO, W0? Zero? zero is dimension. Uh, I want, I, because I'm working with quantum mechanics, so I want to, yes. Okay. So exercise for five minute break is, is, is to show that this is omega divided by four pi, where omega is a solid angle which is swept by this unit vector in evolution. So if you take this, it's characterized by solid angle omega, and this omega divided by four pi is precisely this number of W0. And we'll discuss this after break, five minute break.
Okay. So our, this important object, important topological object. Uh, so first of all, I was not specific enough. Of course, this has a meaning of omega by four pi. Only if you have closed paths, right? So I assume that my M field makes some closed paths on the on the surface of unit sphere. And the question is, what is this integral? What does this integral represent? Well, one thing, of course, would be just assume that theta is constant. Then it's then then this integration will give you two pi, and and uh, you know formula two pi one minus cosine theta as the solid angle of the cone, and that immediately gives the answer. But of course, you can also think of this uh, in the following way: this, uh, if you take derivative of this one minus cosine theta, so you can actually see that what is written here is nothing else but sine theta d theta d phi integrated over theta. But this is the surface element of the, of the area on a sphere. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm computing this area and then divided by 4 pi, which is the, the area of the sphere. And which is, of course, the fraction of the solid angle to, to, the, to the total solid angle. OK? Does it make sense? Already from here, you see that this term is topological. If you have the n field which goes around this loop, no matter with what velocity is, no matter how you parameterize time and how you speed it up, if it performs this closed loop, the answer is the area right, of the sphere. So it doesn't depend on the reparameterization of time, which is the signature of, of being topological. Right? But it's very different. It's not integer number at all. Okay? And it does change equations of motion. Without this term, you would not have that, that equation of motion at all. OK? So this is an example of totally different type of topological term. And here, we have to do some exercises. Um, one thing is that we want to be able to write this term in some way which does not select a particular coordinate system. So what I did here is I used direction of h as my North Pole direction. I introduced theta and phi adjusted for this h. And I wrote this term, but h can be moving, and I want to see SU2 symmetry explicitly, and I don't see it here. It's realized in some non-trivial way, right? So the first thing is, is, is uh, to write it explicitly, but it's not so easy. You need some, and this trick is the following. Let's write it this way. This is the answer. So, okay, let me use notations, correct notations. What is written here? Well, I, as usual, assume that my trajectory is periodic in time. Therefore, I'm thinking about time as circle. So my time goes from zero, goes around, and, and time beta <laughs> coincides with this. And I have unit vector at every point here. And this time evolution of, of unit vector is, is, is described by this picture. Okay. So it means that essentially I have a mapping of a circle into a two-dimensional sphere, which produces this path on the surface of the sphere. At every point here, I have direction of unit vector, so every point here corresponds to some particular value of, of a two-dimensional sphere, and this whole circle produces the path on the surface of the sphere. Okay? So this, is, this describes what n of t is, this, this thing, right? But what I want is I want to extend this configuration to this. And I do it in the following particular way. I will require that n in the middle looks up. And I introduce rho variable, which is the radius. Yes? I think I could use on a stupid thing, so maybe I'll ask you. I 
equation for this particular Hamiltonian is indeed constant, but I want to be able to understand this term for any type of Hamiltonian where trajectory can be totally different. That's one thing, classically. Secondly, remember that my plan is to plug it in into pass integral. And in pass integral, I have to take all trajectories, not just equations of motion. So even when you say that this corresponds to the area, it corresponds to the area once you integrate over theta as well. Right. No, here theta is time dependent. No, no, I'm saying that take any trajectory which is characterized by phi of t and theta of t. The only condition is that it's closed. It's at the end, it comes back. Okay. The end, this quantity which is written here is a, is, a, is a solid angle divided by 4 no, pi. I think he's, taking, he's asking if a solid angle is only no longer the trajectory of motion. No, any trajectory. That's what I'm saying. Take any trajectory. This is arbitrary pass on the surface of the sphere. Compute this integral on this trajectory. This will give you the solid angle of this of this gap. Yeah, yeah, but if you if, if you are not allowed with the push of motion, the t phi dot cannot be written as the phi because theta depends on t as well. No. Okay, exercise. <laughs> Show that this is actually solid angle, no matter what trajectory you take. I didn't say anything about equations of motion. Take any phi of t and any theta of t such that phi of t plus beta count, comes back and phi of theta t plus beta also periodic. Substitute it here, compute. This will be the solid angle. Okay? With some small footnote, but then we will explain this footnote. Okay? This is just math problem, right? It's What is, beta is just, uh, I'm considering beta is a period of, of my trajectory. I, I'm saying trajectory should return back to its point. I call this time in which it returns beta. It doesn't matter. As you see, it doesn't depend on beta. Okay. If you knew differential forms, then you would see that what I wrote here is exact, precise, and doesn't need any explanations at all. This is just the answer. And how it goes. Okay, but if you don't, then I can explain it later. But we will do some exercises which help you to clarify this as well. So what I'm trying to say is that let me now do some other thing. I'm saying that let me take this trajectory, which is a physical trajectory. So physics is only on this circle because this is actual time. Okay? Let me extend in arbitrary way into, into the bulk so that it's continuous and smooth inside, giving these boundary values of n. One example of doing this is just put uh, n in the middle up. So I will say that my n now is a function of rho of t and rho, such that n of t and rho equal 0 is 0, 0, 1, looks up. And n of t rho equals 1 is actual n of t, my physical n, and this is smooth, okay, sufficiently smooth inside, okay? So, so far I just said, having this n, I can extend it inside. And by the way, I cannot extend it inside in a smooth way, in particular because pi one of S2 is zero, because this contour can be always, always contracted so there is no topological abstraction in the, in the continuum. But it's more or less obvious that you can. Okay? So let me do this. Then my claim is that if you take this integral, then this will be giving the same values as this integral with a small footnote, which I will explain later. Okay? And this can be considered as the effective action here instead. Now this one, you see there is a vector product of, of, of derivatives of this mu nu takes values t and rho, right? So, and this epsilon mu nu is an symmetric symbol between t and rho. Rho is artificial, t is physical. So my claim is that if I vary this over n, then I will produce what is needed, what is needed there. And it will only depend on physical n, not on the extension. 
That's the logical part of the story. Okay. Any questions so far? So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to actually do one exercise in detail. I'm going to now take a variation of this with respect to n and show that it depends only on the physical values of n. Okay? Compute it, actually. Yes? I'm still a little confused by the fact that we started from a problem where the modulus of the guy was fixed. So Models of? Okay. Yeah. It's so, uh, very well. What is the meaning of that? Allow me to take some intermediate values in between. No, I don't take values. Modulus of n is always one. No, no. Sorry. N is up here. It's somehow like this, but it's always of unit length. So I extended it from here inside, but n is always unit vector on the two-dimensional sphere. I want to extend it from the surface where it begins before to the whole the interior. Right. I, I want to extend from the circle to interior of the circle to the disk, the function n. But but I want to keep the n squared equals one by all means. Okay. You can actually extend it this way as well. But but uh, you can actually make connection. But so far I don't even care. I'm just saying actually that trick will be useful a bit just a second later. But for now I'm just saying that let's take arbitrary n of t because it's periodic, I can write it on a circle and then just extend it an arbitrary way inside. What I have to show is that first, if I want to claim that this w0 is my action for that problem, then first of all, I want to show that its variation does not depend on the extension. right? And secondly, I want to see how w0 itself depends on the extension, whether, does it, whether, whether it depends on the extension or not. Because variation does not depend on extension does not mean yet that w0 does not depend on extension. That will be the cru crucial point. Is the part of the picture, just that the, that, uh, that the circle is the, is the polar part? Is the, is the oh, Andrea, you, you're messing up with my time. <laughs> so, you see, if I have this trajectory, nobody asked, but, but I could have set the, the solid angle here, for example. Yes. That would be not this part, but that part. But that's, but the that's another extension. So what I'm saying is that you really can construct extension using this, yes. indeed. Uh, so that's fine. That's one of the possible extensions. But for now, I want to keep it totally arbitrary. I'm just saying, extend it in any way you want, and then we'll analyze how it depends on the extension. Okay? What is North Pole? You see, my point here, and the goal of going from here to, to there, is that I want to forget about North Pole. I don't want to have any special direction. I want to have explicit symmetry with respect to rotations. No, so far I'm saying that my starting point in as n of t ex extended inside the circle in arbitrary way. I just give you example, but, but I can even forget about this one. I can take any inside. You mean it's a yeah, yeah, I mean, do it this way. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, I don't care. It's a matter. You will see in a second. Okay? With, with the footnote. Well, you, you will see in a second what footnote is. It's, it's actually, it's already actually obvious from our discussion here about this upper cup, lower cup. But we will see in a second. Let me first do it by step. First, let me show you that this expression is actually legitimate candidate for being action of zero plus one dimensional series. That it doesn't depend on this extension which I introduced as a tool, right? So what I just did is to make it SU2 invariant form. I introduced some arbitrary direction rho as a tool. But I don't want my physical results to be dependent on that, right? So. Uh, let me now just take a variation. Suppose that I have this action written in my zero plus one dimensional quantum mechanics. And it works this way, uh, or classical mechanics. You, you give me trajectory of n, I do arbitrary extension and compute that term. 
And now what you have to do is you have to find the subtle point of this uh, to take a variation of this section with respect to n. And let me show you how it works. This is actually a beautiful calculation. because I promised you to do it in detail, so let me explain what's going on here. I take a variation of, of, of W0. For this, I have to take a variation of N here. I have to take a variation of N here, and I have to take a variation of N here, okay? If I take a variation of N here, then I can permute it, get minus sign, exchange mu and nu, get minus sign from epsilon mu nu, and that will be the same as taking variation of here, therefore, coefficient is doubled. It's not one over eight pi by one over four pi here. Okay? That's the first thing. So I do not write variation here. Why don't I write variation here? So I have delta n, d mu n, d nu n, which I'm supposed to write if I do variation carefully. The question is why don't I write here? Can you show me that this is actually zero? Yes, there is a scale problem, yeah. Yes. Right. Tangent. Yeah. So you have, remember that you have n squared equals 1. Therefore, d mu n is some tangent vector to the sphere. d nu n is also tangent vector to the sphere. And delta n is also tangent vector to the sphere. The mixed product is the volume, which is, which is formed by these three vectors, but they're all in one same plane, so volume is zero, so it's zero. Okay? So therefore, because of that particular constraint, actually, just this is the whole answer. So I okay, just to vary this term. Okay? Then the next step is the following. Okay, why can I do this? So when I apply this derivative, I apply it here to get this, obviously, but I also can apply it here. So why don't I? For the same reason, because this will be three vectors tangent to the plane, zero, and I can apply also here but then will be d mu d nu, and this is anti-symmetric symbol, derivatives commute, so this is also zero. So there, therefore this, this is possible. So you see that this is the total derivative, right? And remember that I'm integrating, now this is not a sphere but circle, I'm integrating on the, on the inside of disk, okay? Therefore this total derivative of the integral of a disk reduced to the boundary of the disk is the integral over time. So as you can see, this is what I wanted to show, that although this looks like it depends on, on the two-dimensional configuration of n as a function of t and rho, but actually it depends only on the actual physical values of n, right? So therefore, this is legitimate uh, classical, classical action in zero plus one dimensional theory.
I mean, simple way to see this is, is to think about Stokes theorem. Okay, so because of epsilon mu nu, this is a curl of some vector. So integral of a curl of a disk should be integral of a field along this one, but the only dimension is time, so it's integral of time derivative. So the other one is normal and it disappears. But oh, anyway, so this happened. I leave you this as an exercise. Okay, just 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 make sure it works. Okay, so. This is the first statement, that, that you can use it as a classical action. But then the question, can I use this as quantum action? Because in quantum mechanics, not just variations are important, not just equations of motion. This I just showed that for equations of motion, I can use this action, because it's variation is physical. But for quantum mechanics, I have e to the s, weight. And I really want to see that this weight does not change uh, depending on my of arbitrary choice of extension. So I have to show not that W0 variation is, 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 is given by this, but that if I take two extensions, W0 of n and W0 of n prime, then the difference is zero, right? So for two extensions, I have the same value. And this is wrong. It, it, it does depend on the extension but depends on the extension in a very particular way, that this value is always integer. And this is my footnote. Just a second, let me complete. This is my footnote. Remember, I was saying that this is equal to this with a footnote. Footnote is that this equal to that up to integer number. So now I'm more specific. Yes? So you have the same configuration n of t, and you extend it as n of t and rho. But you can do it in many ways. Let's do it in two ways. One is called n of t of rho, and then n prime of t and rho. Two different extensions from the surface to the bulk of the disk. And then I, I subtract the actions which are computed, the, this integral computed for these two different extensions, and my claim is that the difference is integer number. How to show that? So this is a two-dimensional sphere of n. And when I extended my boundary field into the, into the bulk of the disk, I have actually effectively mapping of the disk into, into sphere, not circle anymore, right? So therefore, I actually have Some, some whatever surface uh, colored on the, on the surface of the sphere. Right? So the boundary here is physical, but whatever this, this thing is, it can be here, it can be on the other side, it's, it's, it can wrap sphere several times, it, 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 whatever it is. Okay? So this is n. What about n prime? It also gives us a mapping of to the, to the some part of the sphere which is bounded by the same curve here. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this minus, put minus in front of n to minus n, and then I will see that in this case it will be this part of the, of the, of the sphere. Okay. And I'm not, I do not think that you are supposed to understand all of this right away. It will be exercise, right? So, and then you take this actually difference of the integral and you say, okay, but now I can write it as just one integral of a full two dimensional sphere of the same object. But now my n is defined in the following way. In, the, in this part of the sphere, it's defined according to n formula. 
And in this, in this part of the sphere, it's defined according to n prime formula. Okay. So what what is exercise is to show that everything works with orientations and all that. So it's 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 not so obvious, but show that this is true. So now I don't know how to call it. Okay, let me call it this way. So this integral now, where you have a mapping of a sphere into sphere. Right? Okay, maybe. Let, let me actually do it more, more, more explicitly. Let me just take this and just write it as the upper. It doesn't matter. I just take this disk and say this disk comes from the upper hemisphere of some additional sphere. And this comes from the lower hemisphere of additional sphere. And then what I have is my configurations n and n prime define me meeting from this full sphere into, into this sphere S2. So this picture is probably even confusing. <coughs> it's, it's actually true, but, but. And then I compute this. OK? Yes? Sorry, when you say sphere, it means that the volume of the sphere is also sphere. Oh, sure, yeah. But here I actually mean, I actually mean sphere, because, because this n is n squared equals 1. So this one is actually sphere. Okay. Yeah. You can generalize this formula so that n is not sphere, and this is not sphere. And it still be correct, but 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 let me do spheres for now. So now the problem for you for, uh, at home is to show that this is actually integer number. Always. Right, right. If I said that it's solid angle, but but that from that in any case was a claim which was also left as an exercise. So now the, the problem is to show that this formula actually also works. And actually, I think that I think as one over eight pi should be there. But it's one over four pi in variation, but in, in the in the object itself, one over eight pi. Uh, I'm almost already showed you this, right? Because because what I showed you is that remember when I varied this w naught then I obtained full derivative. And I said that because it's full derivative, it goes to the boundary. But now I don't have a boundary, right? And therefore, the variation of this object, of this object, from full sphere to full sphere, is zero. So you are free to choose n in any way smoothly to form it. But the variation is zero, so it's some constant, sort of. But you have to show that it's integer number, yes? So I have n of t. Uh, well, I mean, I vary here, I vary n everywhere inside bulk as well. OK. But then the three volume, like, wherever is two, like, is the start of the volume and the three vectors line, yeah. not producing any volume, why were all because I extend it n anyway, so the 10 squared is 1, so it's still in the sphere. So all the different variations at that time, like all the variations, are on, on the same plane? If you take unit vector and try to change it a little bit, the only way to change it is to rotate it slightly, and the change is, is tangent to the sphere. D mu n, D nu n, and delta n are all small changes of n. They all belong to tangent plane to the sphere at that point. Yeah. And therefore, it's zero. OK, anyway, this is an exercise. And I specifically do not hint, uh, do not give you a hint how to do that, because I want to communicate to you. So come with questions after the lecture. OK, so and now uh, another one more exercise is actually to complete that story and to show that if you take action, which is written there, the first line, that classical action, that, that classical action actually produces you the classical equations of motion for precession, which we, are talk we were talking about. Right? This is not so simple, because uh, remember how you do it. You take classical action, equation zero, and, and you get the result. Uh, this is too naive because you have to remember that n squared is 1. 
So you have to vary this over n, remembering that n squared is 1. The best way to do it is to add Lagrange multiplier to the action and vary it together with varying over lambda and, and everything. And then you will be able to get the, the precession equation of motion. But this is still a very important exercise to derive this equation just for story to be completed. Okay. Now, the most important point of this story is that we see that this W naught is not actually well defined, but it only defined mod k from integer numbers. Okay? So there is no problem with classical story because in classical story you need only variation. Variation does not depend on anything on physical. So you reproduce equations of motion. This is your exercise. What about quantum physics? In quantum physics, remember that this term comes uh, with a coefficient minus 4 pi s w naught. <coughs> this is the action. And there is i in front of the action, as usual. OK? Now the question, is this well defined? The action itself is not well defined. It's defined only mod k. But if you change w naught by k, the weight will change by minus 4 pi i s k. Where k is arbitrary integer. Suppose k is 1. Then you can only use this when s is either integer or half integer. So you can actually, from this point of view, you can actually say that spin is integer or half integer because otherwise this classical action cannot be quantized. That's the reason for s to be integer or half integer. And this is a very famous phenomenon which is known as a quantization of coupling constants. And this is the reason Dirac thought that electric charge is quantized in the universe. Because if you have one magnetic monopole somewhere, then making the same type of procedure, you will see that its quantum mechanics is well defined only if electric charge is a multiple in the units of monopole charge. Okay? Of one of monopole charge. But anyway, so and this is one of the very few ways we know, fundamental ways for know of something to be actually quantized fundamentally. So the, the reason that quantum mechanics allows for multi-valued functionals, but under the conditions that coupling constants corresponding to this multi-valued functional should be quantized in proper units. Okay? So this is this story, and you have to stop me at the latest possible moment. Okay. Okay, any questions? Because I know, yeah. Yes. Uh, so it means that the No, 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 no. So, okay. The two here is not important. What I was saying is the following. I want to write this W node here. How do I write W node? I take my physical N, extend it in some way, and, and, and compute it. But then the question is, how does it depend on the extension? I take two arbitrary, not because there are only two, there are infinitely many, but I take two arbitrary extensions and say that their difference is actually given by this quantity, which is integer. And that's an exercise. Okay? So what I'm saying is that if here, by choice, I would take the same configuration of n of t, but extend it differently, I could have obtained something which is different by k. But this does not matter because S is quantized. But K can be any integer. K can be any integer. Depends on my extension. But if 2S is integer, then no matter what K is here, it doesn't matter. It's still multiple of 2 pi. So your point is that we have the particular Yeah, this is necessary because my physical path is N of T. It should not depend on, on my way to extend it. So. Quantizing S, I guarantee that it's well defined. It does not depend on the extension. And this is also true for S because Classically, what's true classically? But classically, 
Classically, uh, it depends on your extension. The, the variation of integer number is zero. So this fact does not absolutely affect classical mechanics in any way. It's just not important there. Of course, if I, if I write W in this form, it's also true that for two extensions, it's just geometric fact. It's not anything to do with physics. But in classical mechanics, when you're interested only in variation of the action, this fact is of no importance. In quantum, when I'm actually interested in the action, it's important. But actually, I'm interested not in the action, but e to, e to the i times action. And therefore, if it's mod k, it's, and, and this is 2s is integer, this is still not, not important. But this gives me very important clues that this s should be quantized. OK? Yeah. And basically, we have more differential into the, the, right. the big DM. Yeah. But this is not to be constrained somehow to recover the whole, the whole the part integral measure DM of, of theory. Because we have more differential in the problem. No, no, I'm, I'm still working with here, it's n of t. Ah, it's n of t. Yeah, yeah. This is not the integral of all extensions or anything. This is n of t. Ah. But, but I want to compute the weight. I compute the weight by extending, but I cannot compute it absolutely, but only up to integer number. But the exponent, the actual weight, is, 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 can be computed uniquely if S is quantized. And one more question. So, n of t can be seen as the trivial extension of n over n t. Yeah. No. So, because n of t is not something you have to solve over the n of t. Yeah. For every n of t, you choose one extension just to compute this, any, and then you, you sum over n of t. Because there is a one more correspondence. Between what? N of rho n of one, one, one. For, any, for any n of t, for any n of t, this is uniquely defined. Okay. If s is quantized, but only if s is quantized. That's the whole point of the story. So for any n of t, I know the weight. Okay. Okay. So let me at least start doing my totally different exercise. Which is um, so basically what I did is I wrote everything by hand for now. I just said, okay, suppose that you have this action, let's do quantization. Let's see how this type of actions can actually appear from more fundamental underlying theories. And for this, let me consider fermionic model. So let me consider the following action. This action is the functional of psi dagger psi and, and n. Okay. And I will not really analyze it classically this time, but I will just going to say the following, that I want to really substitute this action into pass integral, integrate out fermions, and see what effective action is generated for n. Okay. Uh, it's, there is some meaning to this. It's not totally arbitrary. For example, well, psi dagger IDT psi is just the evolution of qubit of this spinner uh, in time. Psi dagger IDT psi is this action for one spinner. Uh, what about this term? This is Hamiltonian. And the way to write it is Hamiltonian, I can write it like this mn dot product to psi dagger. Sigma Psi. Okay. This is the spin of fermion. Right? And this N is like a magnetic field. 
So what I'm doing here is I'm saying that uh, what I will be more interested in is I'm taking the limit of m going to infinity. So that this fermion is actually really attached to this m. So when I move n, the fermion spin one half follows this m. So what I expect to get as a result is I expect to get result exactly that action, but for spin one half. Because this n is like a dummy direction, but if I move it, spin one half of the fermion in the limit of m to infinity follows this n all the time. So essentially I'm moving spin. So therefore the action for the n should inherit this spin action and then I have to produce that. Okay? That's my exercise. And uh, another way, and, and this of course physically is nothing else but Hund's rule, right? Uh, Hund's rule in chemistry, if you study chemistry. Very important rule. Which, which saying that if you have some ion with a spin and you have electrons, that electrons tend to align with this ion. So now I'm just assuming that this ion spin is really huge. And, and then electrons just, just trying to align it with, with. So the, if they're not aligned, the cost is m. Okay. Okay. So first thing I will do for, to be consistent with everything else is I'm doing weak time rotation. Uh, weak rotation, yeah, of time. So I always forget my sign, so let me write it tau equals i t. The tau is my imaginary time. Now, and it's very easy to see that, and now I replace it, okay, let me put tau here, but I will use intermittently time and, and, and tau. Uh, time, tau, psi dagger, d, tau, minus m, and sigma, Okay, so this is my action. Okay. And this is my quantum action. Integral of upside dagger psi n of e to the minus s psi dagger psi n. And I want to write it as integral over n of e to the minus S E effective of N. I want to integrate out fermions. Ask, ask questions because I am planning to answer you to do the rest of my lectures and exercise. So it's better that you understand how problem is posed.